So Rob said no introductions necessary, and that is totally true. Well, but, it's uh, just a waste of time. Anyhow, we're, we're extremely honored that uh, all of the faculty have, uh, have come here and uh, that, that Rob especially is, uh, is giving our keynote address uh, for this conference. Thank you. All right, so we want to make this fun. This is not going to be talking about data. There's not going to be a lot of curves. It's going to be about value, fun. I see that Lindy Butler is coming in. Lindy, thank you for coming. What we're going to do is try to talk about quality, outcomes, stuff like that. So financial disclosures. I would argue today if you don't have at least one slide of financial disclosures, you're not going to get anything accomplished. So I have two or three. Dennis agrees. There you go. So look, I'll talk to anybody, especially if you have money. God bless you. I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, I've talked to all the robots. I have been on all of these robots in the last eight weeks. And I've got news for you. They've got a long way to go. So I keep hearing about intuitives in trouble. I don't think they're in trouble. I think their stock split for a reason. I talked about this company that really I think is critical because the edge, you know, I just got off the phone with my son here at the break. He's having a little problem hitting a low inside curveball. You know, all my kids got drafted in baseball. My younger son's a freshman at Columbia. It's all in the video. I said, send me the damn video right now. So at the break, I'm looking at his video. Why is it different for a surgeon? Why is hitting a baseball more valued than taking out somebody's lung cancer? I would submit to you that we are screwed up as a culture. Uh, other disclosures, I consult for CHS, the L202 hospital. So if you work for CHS and I'm consulting for you, I'm in conflict of my contract at NYU, but I don't care. In addition, I bought this book, and some people bought it today. <laughs> and I've written a second and third book, and actually, the second and third book covers are out. This is the cover of the third book. Tell me, do you guys like this? Be really honest. If you saw this, would you buy it or just blow by this damn thing? Do you like the puzzle and the, what? It's a little busy. It's a little busy. So I agree with you. Seems like, how about that red? You think we need the red for crisis or maybe just the two light bulbs are in red, which was my well, you idea. You've got two metaphors there. You've got the light bulb and you've got the jigsaw puzzle. The well, the light bulb is the idea for solutions and the jigsaw is the, the problem, but you don't like it. No, this is good. I need a little customer feedback because we haven't gotten the print on this. Okay. So what... You what? You want a lighter color in the background? Interesting. So in other words, the book's got no friggin' shot. <laughs> okay. Um, but look at this bottom part. The bottom part is really what I think is the key in your hospital. For instance, one, one thing that will resonate with you. If your anesthesiologist gets paid per hour and your nurse gets paid per hour and you get paid for doing cases... Do you really think that's going to lead to OR efficiency? Do you think that lack of alignment is the problem? It's the same thing in healthcare. So improving value via higher quality and lower cost, it's all about tying people's purse strings together. How about this as the cover of book number three on leadership? You like this co book cover? You do? Really? Oh, th because it's not, um, because it's not yet been approved by me, that shutter, that won't be in there. It just means someone made it up on a damn screen and they just emailed it to me yesterday. So it's a great question. You tell me. It can go both ways. And I think, you know, the problem for a lot of us is when this guy and this guy started at the bottom here, that was medical school and high school, I was kicking dirt in that guy's face and beating his ass up the mountain, right? I think once you finally get to a platform, and you have to be competitive. It's okay to be competitive. But once you get to a platform, which everybody in this room is in, I would suggest to you the same thing I just said with my kids. I can't wait to kick your ass in ping pong and in free throw shooting over Thanksgiving because we're all going to get together in Birmingham. I still want to beat them, but I don't need to kick dirt in their face on the way up. If I get up there, I can pull them up and try to make them better. So I'm not saying don't be competitive. I mean, I, I just took my temperature in the recovery room last week to prove I have a higher temperature than the resident. I mean, I want to beat them in anything. I get that. But um, I think you want to do it in a, in a constructive way and in a fun way. So I want to start off with probably my most important message is we are honored and happy to come to our OR in any way. You can come. All you have to do is talk to, I think it's your intuitive rep or a rep in the hospital about signing up for one of our in-touch that allows you to watch, uh, watch us do an operation. 
Uh, you can watch us on your phone. You can watch us in a conference room. I've done this to Cardiff, England, in front of 100 people. I've done it to Italy in front of 200 people doing lobes, segments, esophagectomies. And here is my email, and here's my cell phone. A lot of you asked for that. I am honored. The greatest honor in the world for me is to have another surgeon come because they actually teach me. We talk about stuff, and it just makes my day more fun than me just yelling at the poor resident. In addition, if you want to come to New York, this is what my terrace looks like in here. This is the view from my terrace. And this is what you could see. We have some drinks. You can ignore the reflection in the glass there. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. There is uh, yoga mats, weights. You'll have to work out. You want to see the city. I have a city view for you. There's the Empire State Building. This is from my apartment, which is one and a half blocks from the hospital. Yeah, so you I are see. willing to come. You will have food there. We'll have drinks there. <laughs> uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, you don't have to go on my bench press. So, A, I want to make this fun, I want to make it interactive, but I do want to go through some things. Value. Well, I love when people talk about the mission and teaching. Guess what? No money, no friggin' mission. You don't have a mission unless you're putting money in the coffer. So you've got to make money. Engaging the stakeholders. How do we engage an anesthesiologist to put the double lumen in quicker? Do you guys have a way to do that here? I'll show you what you've done at NYU. How we're going to train residents. We're not going to train them just in technology and robots. We're going to improve their leadership skills. This is something that's absolutely critical. Is where surgeons who should be the best leader in the hospitals haven't been because we've kicked too much dirt on the way up to the top of that mountain. I think we're all getting better in this, but we need to teach these skills. Lean. Uh, lean is one of the things that I have a Six Sigma in. I did that when I got my MBA, but anybody can learn it. Anybody can be interested in it. We have an article in this month's annals, apparently, that's online. I haven't seen it, but we wrote it two years ago about just reducing the number of instruments in a surgical tray. Incredibly simple stuff. Even a jackass like me can do it. It's simple, it's easy to do, and it'll save you money. And really, none of this matters if you're not happy at home. So I'm going to end on really the single most important point, and that is what we value the most is our, our kids, our children. Everyone in this room at some point was a child and at some point was maybe a parent, if you're lucky, or if not, it's coming, or at some point was a spouse, a brother, a sister. Those are the roles that we should be measuring. Those are the much more important roles than being a robotic surgeon, but yet not many people measure that. So I'm going to ask Bernie, who's sitting right here in the front row, how many operations did you do last year? 351 operations. How many times did you take your wife out to dinner? No idea. So, and he's a great husband, and he is a great father. He coaches his kids' basketball team. He goes to all of their lacrosse, baseball, basketball. He actually coaches them. But yet, we don't measure those things, but we probably should. Value. I love when people think that value is something you talk about when you've had a whole bunch of glasses of wine after dinner. It's not. It's a formula. It's a formula. Value is quality over cost. You can all complain about the empire. Oh, this, the nurse doesn't know if this is good. The OR administrator is no good. The CEO doesn't know. It doesn't matter. That guy's calling balls and strikes all day. You better live with that guy. He ain't going anywhere. That guy with the blue uniform is going to be there all afternoon. You better throw to his strike zone. And if value is quality over cost, and cost is in dollars, quality has to be in dollars. So stop telling me you did a good operation. Rather, tell me, I didn't have a conversion today because a conversion cost $9,300. That's what it cost in Birmingham. I did a great operation today because I took out, I did an R0 resection. And when there's an R1 resection, it costs the institution $145,000 over two years. Those are the things that guys like me, I'm an administrator, I want to see. You want another robot? Show me that you have less recurrence of two or three years, which is what we've done. We have not one but two payers in New York City, two of them, that pay us more money to the hospital, not to the surgeon, more money to the hospital if you do a robotic lobectomy than a VATS lobe. I'm going to say that again. We have two payers in the tri-state area that give us more money to the hospital for a robotic lobe than a VATS lobe. To me, the ball game's over. They see value, but that's because we've showed it to them. I've showed it to them in granular ways and in numbers they understand. 
The problem is there's a thousand friggin' umpires when you do an operation. You got the nurse, you got the insurance company, you got the patient, you got the family, you got the resident, you got the medical student. How do you keep them all happy? Well, it's hard to do. Depends on your vantage point. The hospital only cares if they have insurance, but all of us in the room don't care about that. But we do need to. We need to do a better job. The patients just want to know if the food is warm and they have a private bed and their pain's controlled. They have no friggin' idea if you did a wedge or a segment. They don't know. So their perspective is different. The surgeon's perspective is different. No one talks about this. The real value of the robot is this. My neck doesn't hurt. I'm, my knee brace isn't on as much. I can go to the gym. I don't feel as sore. Is there value to that? Well, I'm putting that numbers into money, showing I'm nicer to the nurses. They're less likely to leave. Nicer to the resident, less likely to be yelled at, get in trouble. P nurses are less likely to leave. I'm maybe going to extend my career. Maybe I can teach better. Put numbers on that and show real value. Payers matter. But unless you have stakeholders in line, unless your culture is immersed in this, you're going to fail. And so in my third book, I talk a lot about what's culture. And it's funny, I ask my kids, how do you define a culture? And no offense to my kids, I mean, they're actually dumber than me, if you can imagine, all three of them. But their answers were just terrible. So I, I would prefer to show you what culture is in a picture. So this is an aerial view, actually, of my house. And it shows what I value. I got a 90-yard football field. I got a full-length basketball court with breakaway rims. I got a little three-hole miniature golf course with artificial greens. This is the same speed as the Masters. This is sand from Pebble Beach. And from the Masters, this is sand from Pebble Beach. Batting cage, swimming pool. What do I value? Oh, I value athletics and academics. And that's why my kids all either went to an Ivy League or got into an Ivy League. I value that, and they play baseball. So think of your institution. If you took an aerial view of your institution, do they value buildings and equipment, or do they value people? And it's people that drive this. It's not this made-up friggin' mission statement that they do in the boardroom, which I just got done doing for our place because we renamed Langone Health. It's where you spend your money, what you measure and publicly report. When my kids got their report cards, I used to take a, a uh, literally a nail and put it in their forehead at dinner so their brothers could see. Public reported their grades. Anything that was not acceptable, they wore on their ass for a week. That's the culture we created in the house. That's what I valued. I didn't want to hear the test was no fair and the teacher was stupid. That umpire is there all, all year for them. It's the same thing in the hospital. If they're going to publicly report on-time starts, whatever the rule is, you better game the system to be number one in the on-time start. If the STS database is a three-star thing, you better find out the rules and be a three-star lobectomy surgeon. Don't make excuses about the umpire. Deliver results just like you would for your patients. So recently I was finishing up a case, and I thought it went great. Patient had insurance, good for, good for the hospital. Operation went great, but I looked at the poor medical student. And there was not the usual mar of dust on that, a combatant. She really didn't, didn't even get to do very much of the skin. It was because it was a VIP. And I started thinking to myself, is that right? Did that medical student really have a good experience? Was this operation valuable to her? Because it was to every other stakeholder, but not her. And how do we engage them if this is our formula? Because the teaching doesn't show up here, but it does. It does you all came to this conference to learn. I know I've learned at least three or four tricks. I'm really glad I came. David, congratulations. Setting this up is so hard to do. The food, the building, uh, flights getting delayed, all the IT, congratulations. I know how hard it is that you did a great job. And really, I congratulate the faculty. Now the question is, what's the value to it? Well, it's enormous, but are we going to measure it? Does your satisfaction survey measure it? No. It's how many patients are going to get better care because of what you taught them here today. And it's a lot, but we don't measure it. We need to find ways to measure it to quantify the value. So we've done this. I'm not even going to show it, but we've done it for money. And now the next way we have to do it is this. We have to do it with this next part of the talk was about lean and efficiency. Because 
work-life balance starts when the anesthesiologist is jerking around with a double luma tube or you're jerking around putting someone's arm on an arm board unless you can do it really fast or positioning them. And if you don't time it, you're not going to get better. And if you don't measure and report it, you're not going to get better. So you can only get better at the things you measure. And so time is the single most important commodity to me as I get older. I'm realizing, uh, many of you know my wife passed away four years ago. I wish I had that time back. My kids are out of the house. I love them young. I love them now, maybe not quite as much, but I, I still love time with them. And I realize my mother's, my wife's mother passed away yesterday during this conference at 1, 1130. She was 96, but she's in a better place with my wife. Time. Time is the single most important commodity, but we waste so much of it. We're in the OR eight hours, and most of us are operating less than 50% of the time. That is not efficient. I'm not going to get too much into what I've done with the business intelligence team at UAB, or now I'm the head of this OR efficiency committee at NYU. But we've got a 1,000 projects going here because it is throughput that makes the difference. It is throughput. It's not just quickly doing an operation because if they can't go to recovery because there's no beds, you're screwed. And if the recovery can't get up to the floor because people haven't been discharged by 9 a.m., you're screwed again. So the days of saying let's build more beds is ridiculous. We can't afford it. I invite you to engage your whole staff. We now have a project at NYU where every single physician has to have a project in throughput and prove it to us and write about it. It allows them to write. It's going to help the overall system. I haven't got this approved yet. This is my idea. But uh, we've, got, we've got it at least for the department has approved it. I don't know if every physician will do it. And then you get this. And I'm proud to have gotten this three-star rating at UAB quarter after quarter after quarter, year after year, including even over three-year periods. But NYU didn't report to the SDS database the last two years. They stopped. They did for nine years, and they didn't the last two years because the data coordinator got pregnant, got married, left. Like, that's the reason? Ridiculous. So we're back to reporting now. Again, it's about quantifying that formula in your favor. So if you want to buy another robot, just do a survey and show the surgeon's comfort level of a robotic case for a VATS. Ask the nurse if he's nicer or not. If he's not, you throw that, that survey out. If they say yes, you keep it. You set up the game to win in an honest way, but to show value for what you have. The umpire is going to be there all day long. The STS database ain't going anywhere. They may tweak it. We may get better at risk factors, but it's going to be there. Don't come back to the dugout and tell me you took strike three and it wasn't a strike, Matthew Serfolio, because I said, oh, it wasn't? Because your ass is sitting on the bench, and that guy in blue said it was a strike. And that's the SDS database. That's your patient who just sent a survey and that said, I didn't have a good experience with Dr. Serfolio at NYU because I never made it out of the recovery room, which has now happened to 30% of my patients. Never happened at UAB in 18,000 cases. I've only done 110 operations at New York, and 27% go home on post-op day one, haven't made it out of the recovery room. They spend the night there. So I'm fixing the recovery room up. i got a couch, a chair, i got a little better curtains, and I'm going to have a couple areas for our patients. I'm not going to tolerate the patient having a bad experience after what I think is a good operation. Own it. Don't, make, don't worry about it like I've heard the surgeons at NYU do, you, NYU do for literally eight years. Just go out and get a couch, a couple chairs, and a little, little carpet there. Now all of a sudden that becomes a floor bed even though it's in the recovery room. It's not complicated. We have to find ways to think out of the box. And then when surgeons get their data, what did I hear? Oh, no, no, that data's wrong. Oh, no, 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 my patients are older. No, no, my patients are much sicker. Th these metrics don't apply to me. Or the best one I heard from a neurosurgeon at UAB is, I only do complicated surgery. I'm like, no, bro, actually you only do surgery with complications. <laughs> Sad but true. That was the discussion we had. Or we get this. How many people here get their OR utilization chart from the, everybody's hands, right? OR utilization. What does it reward? The slowest surgeon who loses the most blood. Why in God's name would I want to reward that knucklehead when that's not the metric to measure? 
Yet every hospital I've consulted for does this. Now, it is so ingrained in hospitals' cultures, you can't convince nursing managers it's not good. So I say, here's what we'll do. I'll let you measure it for a division. And if you want to say this division should lose some ORs or block time, fine. General surgery, plastic. But for the individual surgeon, it is absolutely ludicrous. It leads to a lack of alignment. The surgeon will just go slower. He's just going to go out to eat in between cases. He's not going to sit there and drive turnover time. Or he'll do something else or she'll do something else. This is not the type of metric that a high-functioning team records. Yet, I see it again and again and again, including at NYU. This, however, is some of the stuff that we look at. The average case turnaround time, the percent first case on time start, the average first case delays where you can really generate real drop-down data as to why. The average subsequent case delay, and I have a paper I'm writing, Dr. Patterson asked me to write, called Lean, How I Teach It, which I'm almost done with this, will be published in um, the annals. And there's a lot more other things here with really clear definitions. For instance, the average in the room, the cut time, that's broken down to when the patient immediately enters the operating room to when the anesthesiologist is completed. Because I represent the anesthesiologist, too, as an administrator. They say it's not fair. You guys are looking from in the room to cut time. The cardiac surgeon spends 10 minutes prepping and draping. I spend about 40 seconds prepping and draping. So it should be till anesthesia is ready. So we changed the rule at NYU four months ago, and we are now have anesthesia publicly reporting their time for the same like cases, how long it takes from in the room till they're ready. Then we're grading the nurses and the doctor, how long it's ready to prepped and draped. Then we judge the surgeon, how long it's incision to incision closed. Then we go back and judge anesthesia, how long is it from incision closed to out of the room. Does anyone here know the median time at their hospital for the latter? What is the average time it takes when you close the skin for them to come out? Does anybody know? Not a single person here measures it. Why? A minute's a minute. Whether you operating or you watching them put a double lumen or you in the lounge. A minute's a minute. So it was 16 minutes at NYU when I got there. We're now down to 11. I want it under 10. I want it under 10. And that's hard because you've got to flip them over. You've got to extubate them. You've got to do this wand over them. And then we've got to get them out. It can be under 10 minutes. And we're not going to be happy. And when it gets under 10, then it's going to be under 9. And when it's under 9, it's going to be under 8. You should never be satisfied with anything until you've gotten everything out of it. This is the way to do it. Measure the things that matter. And if that doesn't matter to you, measure something else. I'm now tying my people in my division's quality, their behavior. So one of their qualities are how many times do they yell at the nurse and what does the nurses say in the operating room about them? That very quickly led to very nice behavior. Isn't that interesting? I can drive the culture however I want based on what I measure and what I report. And I love seeing when a plan comes together. I flew, and I did fly to Austria, actually, and I got off the airplane, and this was so fantastic. I had a videotape. This is lean. This is efficiency. You're getting off not one spot, but two. You're picking up your bag, and you're gone. Love that. Delta doesn't seem to do that for me at JFK. I can tell you that. Then you can actually write about it. Uh, and this is a paper I really invite you. You don't have to read it. Just print it off and jam it down your anesthesiologist's throat. Make them read it. Because it talks about all this stuff. It talks about the fact that we did uh, 2,000 lobes, most for cancer, central lines, which we started off went from 75 to zero. No one here uses central lines anymore, right? When we started, David, when you and I were fellows and residents, that's what we use on everybody, central lines at the Mayo Clinic, right? Epidurals, gone. Arterial lines, gone. Foley catheters, not gone so fast because I went too far. I had too many men getting a Foley in post-op, so we're back to putting them in selected men's with Nocturia greater than two at night or on Flomax. And we looked at all of this stuff, and all we did was drive the times down. Everyone's talked about this, ERAS, ERAS, post-operative protocol, standardization, my God, we did this in 2011. That's when it was published, meaning we were doing it in 1998. This isn't new. This is ridiculously old. It's new to the colorectal surgeon. The thoracic surgical community is so far ahead in database 
and post-op protocols and other specialties. We need to sell it. We need to become leaders in the hospital because we've been doing this. But we haven't standardized our operative technique, and we haven't yet standardized how to see patients pre-op. So if you align surgeons and hospitals and you provide these things, how do we now teach? How do you teach if I'm under the gun for a perfect operation with no conversions? How do you teach if I have to get out of the OR an hour and 45 minutes? Well, you can only do it, and you can only do it if they're engaged. So the first thing is to get the athlete engaged. We wrote this paper about robotic lobectomy could be taught while maintaining quality. How did we do it? Well, we broke it up into 19 parts, and we said you got 45 seconds for this part, two minutes for that, three minutes for this. If you can't complete it, I complete it, but then you get to start the next phase. So they're always operating, but they're never operating and finishing the operation until they could. My last two fellows could do it all the time routinely. So the fellows were doing robotic lobectomies in an hour and 45 minutes, skin to skin, and they knew I couldn't wait to steal the controls. So I was thinking, 30 seconds, you got 20 seconds, you got five seconds, get around, and you watch it get nervous. It's great. I love it. Because now I'm also getting them ready for when they get into bleeding, how to control your nerves and how to be under the clock. The fact that some uh, attendings say, oh, I want to be the greatest teacher in the world. And you can't spend six hours in there, man. You can't do it. It is not good for the patient. It's not good for the hospital. It's not good for our income. It's not good for your work-life balance. There has to be a mix. And then we did this. We looked at quality metrics. Um, of 778 patients where we put 53 benchmarks of all these things that should be done. And we didn't do them in too many. It was very disappointing. It was a failure paper, one of my many papers that showed we failed, but we tried to deliver quality metrics. These are the, the actual 19 steps of what we had them do. Mark out the ports in the skin, gave them two minutes. Put the ports, you got nine minutes. Put the camera in, you got a minute. Take the ligament down, it really should be 30 seconds. Look, we're giving them two minutes, it's ludicrous. Take the ligament down, is about a 20 second thing. Take the lymph nodes out, seven minutes. This, there was a large failure rate on. Very high failure rate on. And I used to go home and say to my kids, oh my God, these residents are so bad. But no, it was the teacher who was bad. When, I, when the bell finally went off on my thick Italian skull, that it wasn't the resident or the millennials who are going to be better surgeons than all of us, by the way. You can keep dog in this generation, but they're going to be better dads, better husbands, better people, better surgeons. Trust me. It's not the millennials. It's the stupid jackass teacher. And I got that question yesterday. How do I get that view? And that is I'd grab the superior segment with the little tip of the tur curved tip up and push the posterior segment in and up. And then everybody could dissect out that number 11 lymph node because I was teaching it better. Just like I'm going to teach my son how to hit that 92 mile an hour inside slider. It's all in the granularity of the details, just like this. And this shows how we went in our first 100 cases where no one was doing anything. The general surgical resident wasn't even being recorded because I wasn't letting that guy do jack. And the fellow was doing only 50%. And these are just taking the ligament down to now they're doing almost all of those steps. And... At the same time, my morbidity fell because I was teaching it better. Now, the operative times, I still can't figure this out. Because once I start to give away a lot, my times do go up. When I don't have a fellow, I can do it much faster. I can't figure out how not to add 20 or 30 minutes, but to me, it's worth it. It's worth the extra 30 minutes. Not two hours, but it's worth the extra 30 minutes to really float a fellow's boat that they did a case, or have a medical student get around an artery or a bronchus or a vein like we did last week, or the medical student, Katie, take those nodes in the case that you watched uh, on In Touch. It's, it's great. But none of it works if the athlete is not engaged. None of it. And so many of you have seen this before, but I got an email when I please show the making the eggs video. <laughs> so I put it in because I got that email. This is an athlete who is not engaged in a process. This is my youngest knucklehead son making eggs on a Sunday morning. And ask yourself, does your anesthesiologist look like this? Look at the body language. I'm like, bro, you just got the orange juice out. You got to go back to the refrigerator and get the milk. You couldn't get them out at the same time. You slept well? Uh, how you doing? Good. How'd you sleep? Fine.
Is this your anesthesiologist or nurse? Now he's gone into the trade twice. Could you bring the double lumen in and the suction? Could you go back to the, uh, back to the pod to get the double lumen? Did we prepare for this operation today? And here's the key. He says, what are you doing? Are you filming this? I'm like, no, don't worry. No one will ever see this. No one will ever see this. And then I said to him, you know, son, you are the worst egg maker in the history of egg making. And he said, Dad, I don't care. That's the key sentence. If the anesthesiologist and nurse don't care, if we're not publicly reporting their time and giving them bonuses for being in first, second, or third, they won't care. So what do we do at institutions? We send people to get a coach. We send them to leadership. We have them get engaged in a bull crap. You don't need initials. All you need to do is show them there's something, it's worth something. Here's the same kid on the same day hitting in my batting cage in the backyard. Okay. Same kid. First of all, it was 100 degrees. He was wearing a hat in the first video. Who knows why? Here he is out in shorts, at least a little more appropriately dressed. He's totally into this. Why? He got into Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, Yale, because he could hit. He ain't smart, but he can hit a baseball. So he got into great schools. It matters. He knows that women really like guys that can hit home runs lefty and righty. There's value in that. So he's engaged in this process. It's not the fact we sent him to get a degree or got a coach. All we did was explain to him why it matters and why he needs to get better. This is, and he is a freshman now at Columbia, and I hope he starts. They have not had a freshman start at Columbia in a long time. Right now he's, he's got a good shot for second base. He's not going to start it short because the other guy's much better. My older son went to Yale. Same thing. It's about coaching. And here's the problem. I taught him this slider. That's his best pitch. Look at his fingers. His first day at Yale, his first day, I told him, I want that index finger on the lower half of the ball so the outer seams on the outer half of your index. That is the best way to throw a two-seam slider, right? First day at Yale, the guy goes, oh, your fingers are wrong. We're going to move. I'm like, bro, really? <laughs> he got drafted. The reason he got you sent him is because he's so good, you're going to change him. Do we do that with the resident? Do we tell him, put your fingers in the hole? Why are your fingers in the hole? Get your fingers out of the hole. Palm the instrument. Don't palm the instrument. Why are you holding your fingers here? Move your fingers back. They go into each OR and they hear different styles, different cultures, different language, different words. It leads to a lack of commitment. The residents get confused. How many of you guys tell the residents to put their fingers in the holes of the needle driver? Do you tell them? No? You tell them to, to palm it. Think they, you don't care. You don't go either way. I think it should be that sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And in a robot. Do you have your middle finger in your thumb or your index finger in your thumb? What do you use? Index. Middle. You use middle because you use the, the other one to clutch. Middle. There it is. Variety. There's nothing wrong with that. As Bernie has said, and Dr. Parks made a great point, it's good to have variety, but we should know the pluses and minuses and teach it all. Um, how do you engage teams? Well, this is my team at UAB. They know I was into time, so we went to this breakout. We would do this maybe every couple of quarters. Uh, at NYU, I've had all the nurses over to my apartment just to tell them we value them. There was a nurse there said, I've been here 21 years. This is the first time I've been to an attending doctor's home. 21 years. That's incredible to me. How can you engage people you work with if you don't show them you care about them or you care about their life and who they are? I'm disappointed with this 53-minute time. It took us that long to break out, but we found Mona Lisa. No thanks to me, and actually the lady helped us, and I think we cheated, to be honest. <laughs> well, because we weren't going to get there, she said, you could do this. And like this voice came over the microphone, I'm like, oh, come on, she's cheating for it. Um, simulation, we've talked about today, I'll skip it. Getting out of your silo. All of us work 12 hours a day. It's so hard to travel and to go see things, but every time I go somewhere, I learn something. We have got to get out of our silos, and even out of thoracic surgical silos. You're welcome to come into my OR anytime, but we need to go into other people's OR and see how they do things. We can regiment where we put the ports. We can figure out how we train and credential. We're doing this pretty well, but it all comes down to this. It's all culture. It's all engagement and culture. And I tell my kids this. I said, listen, I'm 5'1". I'm, I'm not smart. I'm not good looking. I'm your dad. Sorry, can't change it. Totally screwed. You're going to have to work harder than the next guy. You're going to have to be a little bit more.
because God only gave you so much. And so I do believe that culture that you create in the operating room at home can make incredible outcomes for your patient. I really believe that. But we don't measure how we do it. And I think once you do, and these are my last few slides, people will come. You know, these are where I've been very blessed to have visitors come from to, uh, to watch us operate from all over the world. And half the time, maybe more, I actually learn more from them than they do from me because we exchange ideas. And then we form friendships. And it's really the friendships is the only thing that you're going to take to your grave. The money, the paper, every paper I've written is going to be obsolete. Everyone I operate on is going to be dead, even the pediatric patients. It's really their friendships and the people you've mentored that matter. And these are the things that we should be tracking. These are the results. How many times do you have dinner with your family? I love to work out. I've got to have a cardio and workout at least five times a week. Weekend away with my family. We do very poorly here. Saw my parents. My dad's 92. My mom's 86. My father doesn't have much, much time left. I've got to see him more frequently. Those are the things we should measure. And with our kids, we should measure these things when they're young, my kids could not get more than a single plus about fighting with their siblings until they heard, hit 14. They're idiots. They were still literally fighting, three boys, at 14, 11, and 8. Despite the fact I showed on the report card, they didn't care. So I found other ways to engage them. There was their video games went bye-bye. Their cell phones went bye-bye. That quickly got their attention. Aligning stakeholders, I think, is the key. So... In conclusion, I would say we should measure the outcomes in all parts of our life. It's great to evolve. I'm doing stuff different today robotically than I was two months ago, and that's a good thing. I think it's okay, but it's really hard. Everyone's afraid of change. We should look at the metrics that matter. I'm convinced we're not. I challenge you to go back to your institutions and really come up with metrics that resonate into value, because right now the ones we're measuring don't. How many in this audience have a list of things to do? How many people have a list of things to do? How many, Eric, how many have on yours, bro? Well, look, give me a number. Ten. Who can beat that? What do you got? 62. Anybody beat 62? I got 112 right now, man. I beat you, right? No, that's, not, that's not the point. The point is what we really should have is not really a list of things to do but a list of who you want to be. I don't want to be the guy that's going to yell at the resident when he comes in and has no idea what case we're doing because they never know. I don't want to be the guy that yells at anesthesia because they're putting the tape too much on the cheek and I've had a patient get a little burn there. I'm going to be nice. So I have to keep reminding myself with the list of who I want to be as opposed to who I used to be, and that has really helped me. I think that's a better list. And finish saying, what's your legacy? You know, when I got my MBA, they forced us to write our eulogy. Think about that. I really think it's a great exercise, and I've said this in many of the talks I've given. Go home tonight and write down your eulogy. God forbid something happens. Today. I did it for my wife, and although my CV was so much longer than hers, and I published a lot more paper, her eulogy was a hell of a lot better than mine in terms of what she did for her friends. So I challenge you to write your own eulogy, and here's the good thing. If you don't like it, you've got time to change it. You can change it tonight. You can pick up the phone and call a high school friend you haven't talked to in 20 years. You can pick up a phone who's maybe having a problem with a kid or a family member or someone who's ill and say, hey, how are you doing? I was just thinking about you. That actually goes an incredible long way, and I know we're busy, but we can do it. I think if we look at important aspects and measure them and we honestly track and evaluate them, we will make more money than ever, our patients will do better, and most importantly, we will be happy with a good work-life balance. I want to thank you for the honor of the keynote and David for inviting me. Thank you.